There we go. Um, so our guest today is Michelle Hamill, a textile artist and advocate for all things STEM, where she will describe here in her presentation where she weaves her background in mathematics and science in her textile work. From single-celled organisms floating in the deepest oceans to the storms on the surface of Jupiter, Michelle weaves her love for science and mathematics into every stitch. So Michelle, if you'd like to go ahead and bring up your presentation for everyone. Can you see that? Excellent, excellent. All righty. Whenever you're ready. Okay, great. Hi, everybody. I'm excited to be here this morning. I just really briefly an outline of the things I'll talk about today. First of all, um, just a little short intro to start where I explain kind of my background and where I live now, um, because I'm in Australia. And um, a little bit about my approach to my work and my thought processes. Um, as Lauren said, please throw questions into the question A section as we go along, because I love questions. Um, there won't be a lot of text on the screen. Um, there's, there'll be a, there's a few slides with a little bit, but mostly it will be lots of photos. Um, so what I'll do is after the little intro is I'll show some of my pieces of work. Um, and some of those, it's just a little um, piece of work. So it's a small piece and I'll do a little, this is how I made it and this is what I'm inspired by it. But some of them are more detailed and there's um, I've got like quite a few images to show you this thought process and the step-by-step -step processes I took on the way through. So um, a little bit of variation in depth into how much depth I go into for each piece. Um, there's, as I said, lots and lots of photos, but for most of those pieces, I do have them on hand as well. So if you have specific questions or you're curious about something, um, then let me know. And at the end, I can switch cameras to my web camera and we can look at details and zoom in on bits that interest you if you like as we go through. So um, just so you know, there's only a couple of pieces I talk about on the way through that um, I don't have anymore. So a little bit about me. Um, I grew up in Tassie. Um, Tasmania, which is a little island on the south, uh, off the south coast of Australia, which is, um, yes, where the Tassie Devil comes from. Uh, and as a child, I loved science and maths. I loved school, but in particular, I was a terror for science. And um, when I was very small, I don't know, about eight, I think, um, I used to sleep talk and I didn't know this, but my mum used to use this to her advantage and she used to go in and ask me what I wanted for Christmas or for my birthday. And one year she came in and asked me what I wanted for my birthday and I said a microscope. And I would never in my consciousness have said that out loud because our family didn't have a lot of money and I, in my mind I imagined this as a very expensive item. But at Christmas, when I opened my Christmas present that year, it was a microscope and I nearly fell over. And I thought, Mum, that Santa was the most magic and amazing man because he knew exactly what I wanted and I'd never breathed a word of it to anybody. So um, that was um, my childhood. Um, my parents encouraged my, my love for all things STEM. And um, after school, where I um, did lots of... Um, science and maths subjects. I went on and did a um, science degree. I majored in maths and physics. And um, as part of doing that, discovered, of course, that um, going through uni, I was the only woman in any of my classes and during, especially during my physics classes, maths was a bit better. So I grew up also with a bit of a passion for women in STEM. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit on the way as well. My parents were both makers, so my mother, I grew up sitting at my mum's feet where she knitted and um, crocheted and quilted and she took me to her ceramics classes and so I grew up with a mother who was always making and my dad was a wood turner, he's a wood turner, he still is a wood turner, <laughs> he turns every day. So um, here are some examples of some of his current pieces that he's made these little forms and then I crochet around them. Um, and I won't talk about those today, but um, so I, and I grew up at his feet in his workshop with wood shavings and making my own um, little things out of wood as I grew up as well. And woven into all of that, I've always loved nature. This is a little scene, picture of me um, quite some time ago on the coast of, east coast of Tasmania, which is a beautiful, rugged place um, full of 
um, lots of the, the island is national park. So I've always loved being outside and enjoying nature as well. So I think um, hopefully you'll see those um, aspects to my background in my work as we go. But now I'm not in Tassie anymore. I'm not in Tasmania. I'm up on mainland Australia, up in the mountains um, in Victoria in a little place called Porpunka that is a little tiny little rural town um, and this is what it looks like. Um, it's we're surrounded by mountains, it's an alpine valley. Um, there's a big river that's absolutely massive at the moment that comes through because we've had so much rain over the last few months. We're all struggling with it actually. It's supposed to be summer, but it's um, gray and wet every day at the moment. Um, thank you, La Nina. Uh, so, um, but this is where I live at the moment. So today is about STEM um, and yes, STEM is science, technology, engineering and mathematics, but my background is science and mathematics. So although I have some pieces that are tech or um, engineering influenced, and I'll talk, show you a couple of those in a second, mostly I'll go through during the section, through the, the session, First of all, showing you some of my science-y inspired um, work and then showing you some of my maths-y inspired work. Um, and there's a little bit of talk about STEAM at the moment. Uh, I've spent the last couple of years working for a project um, that's a federally government funded project to inspire girls to take up STEM um, study and eventually careers. And there's a lot of talk about STEAM in that space because um, and that's about putting an A in STEM, which is the arts, and really emphasising that a lot of science careers are very cross, um, STEM careers are very cross creative spaces and that creative thinking and artistic thinking and bringing those two things together is super important. So um, that's a space that, again, is very close to my heart and you'll see some of that on the way through. And just to show you some of my slightly whimsical um, pieces that are inspired by technology and engineering. I have, um, I'm working a lot in a space at the moment where I'm interested in stability and how pieces stand up and trying and sort of engineering my own stand up embroidery. Um, and this is a bit of a crossover because it's a little bit about engineering a piece and a little bit about um, a microorganism that I'll Flick through this and this is a little beetle I made once that was for a friend who was very into technology and so one of the things I super enjoyed at uni was doing um, logic through via um, logic gates so that's a, a little piece that was inspired by that so not going to really be looking at much of the engineering and technology side today it's mostly about science and maths so that's my background um, is maths and physics, not art. I did love art at school. And as you can see, I've always made things. I've made things every day since I was a child as well. Um, I always had a latch um, hook rug kit in my birthday present or a cross stitch kit or something like that um, as I was growing up. So I was always stitching um, in some way or another. If I got sent to my room for being bad as a child, it didn't work very well because I just went to my room and sat there and knitted or cross stitched or had the time of my life making something. So um, that wasn't a very good punishment for me as a child. Um, and even as an adult, I did a lot of cross stitch. Um, I don't know if anybody here is familiar with Teresa Wentzler. Um, as a cross stitch artist, I loved and used to buy all her books and her kits and made lots of her pieces. Um, but as I started to move into doing my own creations, so not doing kits and patterns, but making my own things up, um, I couldn't help but bring my science and maths background into that. So that's part of everything I do now. And it's not just about what inspires me, although that is part of it, it's also about my process. I have a very strong process of sampling. Um, I do a lot of sampling work. Sometimes that's very free form, but often it's looking at uh, changing one variable at a time. It's a very sort of scientific method approach. I'll look at what will happen if I change, do the same stitch with five different threads, or I'll look at if I do the same thread, but five different stitches and like, and, and stitch those out as a grid and compare them all. And what happens if I change that color slightly you know, across these five different samples? So I tend to do this repetitive sampling kind of approach often to my work, which 
has a um, tradition, of course, in needlework anyway, but um, it, I feel very, it resonates with you very strongly with my um, scientific background. I'm particularly obsessed with systems, with patterns, especially patterns that are repeated at different scales, uh, patterns that occur in nature, that have a mathematical underlying um, rule that is clear um, or complex. And I love that sometimes a simple rule can create a complex system or a complex pattern. And uh, that's the kind of um, thing that I really enjoy. And I think partly it's that maths background and how that is exhibited in biology or how it's exhibited in chemistry. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, so that's enough about my background. I would next thing we're going to look at is um, some of my work. As I said, there'll be some small pieces. The first piece I'll show you will be a little piece. Um, and then I will step you through what inspired it and why I made it and a little bit about the technique. I know everybody has a different approach to their making and their art making. And I don't have an art background. I don't have art training. I've never been to art school or art university. And so the way I work might be very different to how a lot of other people work. Um, but I hope that seeing what I do and how I do it will inspire people who don't also don't have an art background to, to take their own path and be inspired by what they love. So that's um, where we're going in the second half. I'll just pause in case there's anything, any questions or anything before I move on. Okay, great. So first piece I talked to you about is uh, this. So I'm starting from the biology space, obviously. The first piece um, I want to talk about is a, very, is a little needle book. So this was inspired by a, a trip to the library. I used to go when I was working in Melbourne uh, in the big city at lunch. I used to go to the library um, quite often to find a quiet space in the city. Um, and sometimes I would just get a random book down and, and flip through it. And um, in this case, I pulled down a biology textbook and started flipping through it and was super inspired by the diagrams of the cells in there. And in particular, my stitching brain couldn't help but notice that the endoplasmic reticulum, especially the rough endoplasmic reticulum, would look amazing if I did it in stem stitch with French knots around it. And I couldn't get that out of my head. Um, so I went home that night, <laughs> got out a piece of linen and I started stitching and I didn't know at first what I was going to make it into. But after stitching it out, I thought, well, you could fold that in half and it could be a little needle book. So this is the needle book. I still, this is like a 15 years ago now, I think, but I still use this needle book. And, um, and so, yes, this is a kind of a literal um, translation of like something that was sciencey that inspired me um, and that that crossover to my science brain and my stitching brain couldn't help but see that little texture and think that would look great in stitch. So this is just a little piece. And then something slightly less literal. Uh, again, you'll see that stem stitch with French knot edging that I can't help myself with here. I'm super inspired by the variety of life that um, you see in the ocean and, and well in microscopic organisms especially in microalgae and diatoms and that um, space where there are so many different shapes and so this piece is not a literal um, take on that but a, a an abstract take on that I was thinking of creatures floating in the ocean and thinking about how I could use different stitches a variety a big variety of stitches to kind of give that impression of life being very varied and having a lot of different shapes and expressions so you can see I've used lots of different stitches in this there's padded work there's couching bullions and beads and um, lots of stem stitch circles uh, I'll come back to that because that's one of my favorite um, things to do is stem stitch circles. Um, for my tiny, tiny little circles, I often just back stitch and then whip them. But I just love that um, that space of uh, that it creates this little circle that seems sort of magic when you do a stem stitch circle. And then I've also it's not obvious in this piece, but that little piece of lace in the bottom right hand corner. And in fact, all of the pieces of, almost all of the pieces of fabric that I've used as the padded pieces in this 
are what I call family cloth. And they're pieces of cloth from members of my family. And so this isn't just an expression of my love for the ocean, <laughs> my love for microscopic life, but also for my family. Um, when my nan passed away, my aunt, who knows that I love stitching, um, told me afterwards that she had, when it was her job to go through Nan's things um, and pack them up after she passed, and that she put aside anything that had nice fabric. Like, so for example, this piece of cloth in the bottom right hand, that little lace motif is from one of Nan's night dresses. So anything that she thought was beautiful, she put aside Nan's handkerchiefs, some of her doilies, anything that she thought that I might appreciate so that I could make with. And it was specifically, she said, this isn't for you to keep as a nightdress. This is for you to make with. And then the rest of my family heard about that as well. And so they also went through their own old hankies and little bits of old doilies and things that they had put away. And they, um, they mailed them to me. And so now I have this little collection of cloth that is like from all the different members of my family. And so this piece is also using some of those pieces of cloth. So that's that piece. Some of these pieces, I have lots of pictures of the process behind them. And this one isn't one of those. I just have the finished piece. So that's that one. But the next piece that I'll talk to you about is a big piece. Um, so I'll just want to go into a little bit of detail around this. This is inspired by the work of Ernst Haeckel. I don't know if you're familiar with his work. Um, he's a naturalist and a scientific illustrator um, and an artist. He, this is a sort of a twisted place in my mind because although his work is very beautiful, he was also a proponent of scientific racism and liked the idea of social Darwinism. So there's some very dark places, <laughs> but he lived in around 1834 to about 1919. So, um, and his work, some of his work very much pioneered some of the work of scientific um, illustration as an art form. And he is actually a scientist as well. So lots of, he went out on, on a lot of voyages and collected lots of samples and looked at lots of these things into the microscope. And so he actually, you know, was instrumental in some pushing some of this science, but um, just, you know, a, a little aside is that it's, it's not all, um, beautiful pictures. There's, some, there's a dark side to his work as well. But to, I, I, I'll, I'll link to some al an album I've made of his work that I think is great for embroidery. I'll, I'll share with you as part of... Um, oh, Mr. Step, the, I'm going to refer to a few things like this that inspire me along the way that I've got links to that I've got in a PDF that I can send out, um, that Lauren can send out afterwards. So if you're interested in the collection of resources that I refer to along the way, you don't need to write anything down or try and scribble down a web address um, that I'll give you all of these URLs at the end. So yes, so Ernst Haeckel and two pieces in particular um, from this two particular diagrams I've made stitched pieces from. So this little uh, six-sided figure on the side, I've made a little, what I call a little floating creature, which is a stitched piece that I stitched on organza using stump work techniques. And it um, sits on a wire and I've wound, wound the wire around a stone. And so it stands by itself. And then the other piece, the piece that's on the right-hand side, I've, this one, I've made into a triptych of sorts um, with three stitched pieces. So I thought I've got lots of photos of the process I did with that, with these. So I thought I'd take you through this as a more detailed um, exploration of how I take an idea from um, inspiration to stitch. I was just very taken with this unusual shape and I thought it would lend itself well to stitch. It's got lots of textures on it. I liked that it had this transparent whole kind of um, suggested with that circle at the top. And I am a big fan of gridded patterns and this had that as well. So it had all of these things that really inspired me that I wanted to take into stitch. So the first of the triptych was a piece that I stitched on silk organza. Uh, I used I, um, buttonhole, actually I think I've got a closer picture here I can show you, yes. So I used buttonhole and um, chain stitch and beadwork and there's some silk um, covered coil in there and 
I stitched that first and then I stitched down a piece of wire around the edge, just couched it down and then did the traditional stump work thing where you do a very small buttonhole all the way around the edge to cover the wire. Um, and then I cut it out as you do uh, and like that. And I also cut out those buttonhole um, circles to make eyelets as well. So that's all on organza. And you can see, by the way, I'm holding it, I'm holding it at the bottom because that wire is still sticking out the bottom. Well, that's part of the idea of the piece is to have this as a floating creature, kind of almost to hark back to the fact that it is a floating, a floating creature that floats around the ocean. So the second part of the triptych I did on felt, I um, cut the piece out and buttonhole edged it. And I do a lot of work with um, sequins that I make myself. So these are just hand cut using a hole punch from a piece of card. And then I stab a little hole in them with a pin and make my own little sequins. And you'll see, I refer back to this technique a little bit in some of the other pieces as well. But I thought that kind of mimicked that little gridded structure as well. Um, and then I stitched on, um, I sort of planned out, I stitched those down and then started looking back at my plan for how that would work. And you can see here, there's the template that I used for all three pieces. So I um, tried to make them all the same shape. Um, and I stitched beads on and I stitched those, um, use similar techniques, chain stitch. I love chain stitch. I'm a big fan of chain stitch, French knots. And then using that um, buttonhole edge as a guide, I stitched wire that wire down again around the edge and wrap, whipped stitched around the wire to cover it. So that's the third, and again, left the wire sticking out. That's the third piece in those. Um, little um, triptych. And then for the third, that was the second piece. And then for the third piece, I wanted to make something using needle lace. I, um, needle lace is something that I use a lot. I um, have for a long time made little beetles that have embroidered wing covers, but for their wings, I usually sit underneath the, the wing cover they're hidden, but I usually make little needle lace wings that go underneath. And I also, I think that my starting slide showed some needle lace um, forms that I'd made um, that I made as part of a little orrery piece I was making. So I, I just really love needle lace. Um, standalone needle lace and needle lace is part of um, other textile and stitched work. So I was really keen to make the third piece from needle lace. So this is, um, standard needle lace technique where you mark your shape out and decide on what um, areas you want to be different stitches and you lay down a coordinate and um, buttonhole stitch over all of that at the end so that um, you end up with your finished piece. I once was also really keen again I like that textiles have so many different techniques you can bring to a piece um, and in this case there are so many different needlework um, needle lace stitches that you can use of different densities and different textures and I wanted them to kind of suggest cellular networky systemy complex things happening within this one little organism so I tried to use a variety of different stitches but also because I wanted to make it feel floaty I wanted to use the denser ones towards the bottom and the more open ones towards the top. So the top is just like a free form networky stitch and the bottom is very dense packed um, need, laid needle um, buttonhole stitches. So oh, that's right. And here you can see that um, as well as laying that wire around the edge, which I, um, this you can see, I've started to lay the wire around the edge and I couch that down and then using the same old, same old needle lace techniques, I lay a whole heap of scrap threads along the edge there to make that edge very um, raised and then buttonhole around the edge. And then that's my third piece, the needle lace piece. And so this is the three of them. Um, it's, I've, I've finished the needle, the needle work, but I have to, come out and be honest here and say this is one of the pieces 
that even though the need of work is finished, I still feel like it's a work in progress because I still haven't settled on a way to, to finish it, to display it. Uh, I've gone through a whole stage of playing with floated pieces on stones and I originally thought I might do that with these and have them have their own large stone that they floated above. But something in me said that I wanted them to sit together somehow. And so, <clears throat> to, because part of the fun of these three pieces is that they interact with each other, that they're semi-transparent, that you can see one through the other, through the other. And so I was still really struggling with a way to present them in a way that showed that they're these floating things and that they belong together, but they're different and that they in some way show that complexity of life uh, and how life interacts. So this is still a, a, work, in, a work in progress. And he, if you have any ideas, <laughs> let me know. So that's- We do have a few questions from the audience if you'd yes, like to take please. them now. Or... Yes, that'd be great. Wonderful. wonderful. Um, so there's a question from Valerie Sofer. How do we find you online? So maybe you could just talk a little bit um, about how I discovered you. You have a very lovely and extensive um, Instagram page that has many beautiful photographs. Do you have any other means of communication? And um, yeah. if you want to go ahead and just pop into the, yep. the chat or um, handle. No worries. I um, have a slide at the end that has all of my um, online presence, but on Wonderful. Instagram, I um, am... So sorry about that. Um, so any no contact information that yeah. uh, Michelle will provide, um, you can email me and that's just my first name. So L-A-U-R-E-N at sfsnad.org. And um, I'll send along a PDF of all of the information uh, that yeah, Michelle is providing. Right. Yeah, and that. but there is my Instagram um, handle in chat. Um, it's very beautiful. So. It's very beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and I do tend to post... If I'm working on something, I do tend to post um, work in progress shots as I go. So um, if you're interested in following along, if I'm doing a big project, if you're interested in following along how that's going or what my thought processes are, or if you want to drop detailed questions about anything you see on my Instagram, please do. I love getting questions on Instagram. Wonderful. So our next question comes from Sue McAllister. And Sue asks, loved your childhood story. A lot of your pieces feature circles. Is there anything in nature which is perfectly round? <laughs> Part of the thing I like about um, saying that my work is inspired by nature is because often nature has a simple rule that you are to follow, but for some reason there's some perturbation, something that um, pushes that um, system during its creation that means it's not quite perfect. And so I use that in my work. So it's not a perfect circle because it's mimicking nature and in nature, those simple rule, perfect rules exist, but often they're not perfect. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so that I, I use that. I don't know the answer to whether there's a perfect circle. Um, my brain immediately wanted to say that a bubble was a perfect sphere, but I don't know that that's true either as it's moving through space and being driven around by the wind and <laughs> but I think I a lot know. of the beauty from handmade objects comes from you know it's not like this factory extruded object it's exactly you know, handmade and there's something quite wonderful about that Ex exactly yes and that you can see the human hand behind it um, absolutely it's super important yes um, so our next question comes from Jackie and they uh, Jackie asks do you have any resources for learning needle lace techniques um, so maybe you can um, talk a little bit just about um, maybe some resources broadly about uh, how you approach your work, because very often with as many techniques as there are in the world, how do you hone in on something that you feel like you want to experiment with? I guess um, for most, I guess it's, it's, uh, for most of those things where it's like a needle lace, it's something I want to explore. I started it's a good example because I started the way I would often start, which is to do an internet search <laughs> and see what's out there um, in terms of tutorials. And for needle lace, there are some, for that standalone needle lace technique that I'm, I'm doing, there are some very good YouTube tutorials put out by a gentleman whose name has eluded me, but I can pop that in our resource PDF. And so, and he has a very clear step-by-step, -step, here are some stitches, here's how the whole process plays out. So if there are YouTube, 
videos of how to do something or if there's somebody who has a website with a step-by-step of how to do something, I often start there. But I'm a very big rebel, I guess, in that I often feel like once I know how something works, even if it's very rudimentary, I then like to take my own path. And so I am one who will probably often not take that advice they give you at the start, you know, never, never go anti-clockwise around or never go this way or never use this kind of needle or never use this kind of thread. And I will often ignore that <laughs> and do my own thing. So although I often like to start with a solid grounding in something, and I very strongly believe in the tradition that underlies some of these techniques as well, and that some of this wisdom has been passed down for a long time and exists for a reason that um, I also like to change some variables when I engage with a new technique as well. Um, and if I, the needle lace is a good example because if I really enjoy it and I really want to know from somebody who's been doing it for a long time, then I'll often seek out a book. I don't have hundreds of needle work books <laughs> straight up, but I will often seek out if there's something like needle lace where I really, really enjoy it or tapestry, which I, um, is another example where I really enjoy doing tapestry and I incorporate a lot of small tapestries in some of my work that isn't touched on here. Um, then again, I'll look for, initially I'll just look at YouTube and, and, and or somebody's website and get an idea, but then I might take a short course or I might purchase a book and, and get into it a little bit deeper. That's my usual um, approach from the needlework side of things. I love that you brought up that um, issue of clock, um, never go anti-clockwise. I remember having a discussion not that long ago, <laughs> particularly about it. And because, of, you know, in terms of like working order and what have you, there are a lot of yes. rules. Yes, yeah, there are and, a lot of rules. Uh, and, some, and sometimes those rules make a lot of sense. And sometimes I scratch my head and think, I'm going to break this one and see what happens. <laughs> sometimes it's a disaster, but um, there you go. Well, absolutely. <laughs> that's, that's the joy of experimentation. I think mm. sometimes when we approach techniques in a doctrinal way, we close our minds off to inventing yeah. a new way to interpret yeah. both materials as well as um, yes. the techniques to achieve yes. a particular end. And that's part of why I enjoy sampling as well, because it gives me a little space where I can do that experimentation without risking mm -hmm. a lot, mm -hmm. many, many hours of work. So. Absolutely. So our next question comes from um, Susan McTeague, um, and their question is, is there any evidence you've come across the biological illustrators were themselves influenced by needlework? It looks to me as they must have been. I know a lot of illustrators, um, a lot of embroiderers actually copied illustrations. So I'm sure to a certain extent that feeds mm. into one another. I don't know if you know a no, little bit I, more on the subject. I, ha I haven't seen any, and I think that if there was an influence there it will probably be downplayed because it, a lot of the prominent scientific illustrators although not a lot of the scientific illustrators but a lot of the prominent ones were men and I suspect mm -hmm. that needlework was seen as only women's work absolutely um, so I suspect right. sorry oh uh, very much so particularly in the western world yes but, yeah um, in the I, western world yes mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, um, but um, I, oh, sorry go ahead <laughs> the influence could still have been there but not but not but not I, spoken about. I do know that a lot of um, individuals would have sought out illustration books as inspirations, particularly yes. as many needleworkers don't feel very confident in drawing themselves. So that's yes. probably why you see that influence. Yeah, um, and I certainly feel that too. I, I, my drawing, I'm not very confident in drawing. That's so. wonderful. So if you'd like to go ahead on with your presentation, okay. we'll wait for Great. some more questions to arrive. Fantastic. Thanks, Lauren. Okay, so staying within um, the, flipping back to my presentation, staying within um, the biology space, one of the um, things that super interests me is cross sections. And again, we're looking at cellular systems and how their different tissues have different cell structures and how the cells often look like they follow a pattern, but that pattern's not quite regular. And uh, this, is the, the pictures I'm showing you are cell structures, but this also happens in geology, in um, chemistry, in um, crystalline structures, in, in, in geological formations. There's, I love the idea that there's layers and the layers interact and the layers are part of, um, of a system or that the layers show different patterns. And this kind of thing, again, screams needlework. And some of these scream needle lace to me. And so the piece I'm going to show you 
next explores that idea of layers um, and different and how they can interact and how um, they can express that, how needlework can express some of those differences in the layers and the structures and the textures that um, are evident in some of these um, places. So this piece um, is about layers, but I was very keen for one of the layers um, this linear, this lower right hand, this linear structure of um, cells, like in muscle cells and lots of other different um, structural cells in plants as well, really inspired me. So I wanted to make something quite linear. And so I had the idea of making lots of wrapped threads. And so I did this little sampler um, of going through thinking about what threads would work for this and what wouldn't and so I and this is the kind of sampling I do and I kind of sometimes I sample like this as I go while I'm working on a larger piece I have what I call my little side cloth next to me which is just hooped up where I can it often is the same sort of fabric that I use for my big piece but I can go through and do some stitches on my side cloth to test something out before I do it on my big piece and just like this I might sometimes I feel like I am definitely breaking a rule here right in pencil on the piece itself so that I can see how, so that I don't forget what I've done where. Um, and so this is just looking at different threads and I wanted there to be texture on the, on the wrapped pieces as well. So I was also playing around with having beads on it and I didn't want the beads to really jump out. I wanted them to look almost like they were part of the structure. And so I'm playing here with different size beads, different finish, whether they're clear or white or pearly. And so I'm also, popping some beads in as I go, just as part of that um, sampling process. And this is a repeated thing that I use a lot. I use a lot of um, layers of um, organzas, and this is a metallic silk organza where one thread is metallic and what is the, the weft I guess would be metallic and the warp is silk um, because they're semi-transparent, but they have a shine to them that I really enjoy. And so this is just me stitching down. I decided I want to do five layers. And so there'll be three layers of like cells. And then in between that, there'll be two sort of connective tissue layers. Um, and so I've stitched down, you can see here, I've stitched down the, the silk, the metallic silk organ. So just using some um, stab stitches really at the edges just to hold it down because it'll eventually all be covered with stitch. So this is just sort of a holding stitch. It, it's fraying, that doesn't, bother me. Um, I like some of that very light flyaway thread you get on the edge of silk, especially like here where I've ripped it. And so you get that very soft edge to the um, silk. And I love that. So I'm doing some of my inter interstitial layers here, where I decided that behind my um, wrapped threads, I would like there to be some sort of thing mimicking either cells or layers of stone. Um, so I'm just using backstitch here and this is free form. I'm just making it up as I go and I just start stitching in, in layers. And I sometimes I might just put a little circle in there and then stitch around it for the next row so I can see how that plays out. And here I've started to do some of the wrapped threads across that layer that you saw me stitching um, earlier just backstitch. So the idea is that there's this connective tendony kind of layer between the two um, stitched areas. And I've started stitching over the top of the silk organza. And so there are three of those silk layers um, that I'm going to cover with my hand cut um, sequence again. Um, I wanted to have three different things that looked kind of cell-like. So the first of those I just went in and used um, a very dense mat of these sequins. My hand was very sore from using my whole punch, um, cutting all these sequins out. And then I just stitched them down with French knots and sort of um, very free form, put French knots between them as well to fill that space. And here you can see the second layer, which is um, I've done the same sort of sequins again except this time rather than stitching them down individually, I've kind of wanted to reflect that this network is a system that interconnects. So I've stitched them with stitches that connect them all together. And you can see I've started on the, that next connective layer. And then for the third um, cell layer, I was being even more, I guess, literal in my cell 
approach this time. And this time I got scissors and I cut larger circles out of this card and I got a tiny little hole punch and punched a hole in them, sort of making a nod to there being a little nucleus in the cell um, without saying as much so. And then I seed stitched um, to hold all of that down. And then for the third in-between layer, I um, made like a needle lace style net um, between the two with a combination of wrapped thread and buttonhole wrapped thread. And this is me just putting a little object underneath because I found wrap, started to find that wrapping the thread with the stitch work underneath, I kept catching my needle. So this is me putting a little button that I'd made underneath so that it held it above the stitches below. So I didn't keep catching those stitches underneath while I was wrapping. I didn't think of that at the time, but improvisation. And this is the finished piece. Um, so there's those three layers with their sort of connective tissue layer in between. Uh, again, it's not a literal nod to cells and geological layers. It's just influenced by, um, but again, I'm trying to um, show this beauty of the things uh, I'd like the surface of things can hide many layers underneath um, and they can be complicated and they can be beautiful. And so that's the sort of design influence behind that piece. So any questions about that before I move on? We do have a couple of new questions. So yes. our next question um, comes from an anonymous attendee. Um, can you repeat how you remove the paper from the repeat shapes? From the repeat shapes. Of the paper. I'm not sure which piece that refers to. Is this from the needlework, the needle lace pieces, maybe? It doesn't specifically say. So maybe you could talk about any methodology where you might yeah. have paper that you ultimately remove. Yes. Um, so, maybe it's just um, a template. Yes. So the templates for those, that triptych piece, um, the only piece where the paper was sort of attached originally is the needle lace piece. And what you tend to do for that is put a piece of fabric behind it so that when you stitch through the paper template, you're stitching through paper, the fabric as well and your thread doesn't come out because often stitching a paper, the paper falls apart and then your, your piece is broken. So what you tend to do is stitch through um, a layer of fabric as well. And then at the end, when you finished your needle lace, you just snip those connecting threads between the paper and the, the backing fabric. And that means that you can then pull your lace away from the template and it actually means you can use the template again and again which i have done sometimes with beetle wings use the same same template again and again to make needle lace if you're very gentle with your stitching and because your stitching for the needle lace doesn't go through the paper it's just that original couching down to the template that goes through the paper so you can use it again and again if you use the same holes excellent <laughs> but, um so our next if i question... didn't answer your question oh, let sorry me know. <laughs> yeah go, go. um um, our next question comes from Andrea Feynman. Um, what kind of wire do you use for the outlines? I know there's a variety of choices out there on the market and a lot of yeah. people do use floral wire, but you yeah. do use a variety, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So I use floral wire too, uh, but I also use um, just craft coated um, colored copper wire because sometimes um, the copper wire that's colored artistic wire, I think it's called, often has colors that match what I'm doing. Um, so, and especially for large pieces, the floral wire comes in a, that I use comes in cut lengths and sometimes it's not quite long enough to go all the way around and I find joining it kind of tedious. So sometimes I use just that craft copper wire and the thickness that I use depends on the size of the piece. If it's a small piece, I just use a, like a 26 gauge, but if it's a bigger piece, I might use it up to a 22 gauge or a 20 gauge wire. Definitely great advice for working larger pieces. And I don't know if you've had issues, but uh, the floral wire in the finer sizes or cake wire very often is what we use in the States. That's the same kind of thing. It's getting harder and harder to find. Oh, unfortunately. don't tell me that. <laughs> don't tell me that. It's so good. <laughs> so our next question comes from Sarah Blossom. Um, and their question is, what sort of creature is that you've rendered so beautifully in white in the white work triptych. Um, at first I thought it was a sea urchin, but maybe it's something smaller, mm, lengthening, yeah. no idea, final representation. Yeah. So it, um, it, it is smaller. Um, mm. I don't have that at hand. I did have one I was working on it. I'll have to go back and have a look. But he does, when I send out the um, PDF that shows his work, he does lay, label all of his creatures that he draws. So that creature does have a little label. But um, 
it's something very long in Latin, so I'm, I'm, I don't remember. But I think that they are uh, microalgae or diatoms because he spent a lot of um, time drawing those and a lot of his pieces are um, around those. I don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure it was like that kind of microscopic sea creature. Wonderful. So our next question that comes from Helen uh, Jor Jorgelin. Um, I apologize if I mispronounce anybody's name. Um, what is the size of these? So um, I know you do mm -hmm. work in a variety of different um, sizes of objects. So maybe you can talk a little bit about yeah. that. And if size is ultimately an important aspect of creating works um, to make it um, either convenient or uh, to work yeah. quickly. Yeah, so um, definitely it's often bred by convenience. A lot of my pieces, especially the flat, the pieces that are just surface embroidery are of a certain size because I have an embroidery frame that I use that I tend to fill up. And so they're often this um, 25 centimeter or 10 inch ish um, size for pieces like the piece you're looking at now is about 10 by 10 inches ish. Um, I have to get it out and check, but it's about, about that. Um, but then some of the pieces, obviously the needle book is quite, it's just like a palm, size of my palm and the little trip titch, um, Hang on, I'll just reach out and grab it. The little trip titch I'll show you in front of my face. And so you can see is they're not huge, but they're not tiny. Um, and at the end, can you see those? Um, at the end, I'll show you, I've got a little webcam here and I can show you pieces in more detail. So you get a feeling for the scale and the size of them. Um, so, with reference yep. to the scale very much in smaller objects, you can get a little bit more intimate in contact with it. Yes. So it makes more sense to um, yes. create and more highly detailed figures with that. It, it's often about how much detail I want to put into a piece as well. Absolutely. Okay. So there's a comment from Jessica um, to make them into a mobile. I think that would be quite fascinating, particularly be, as you have some be. interest in astronomy as well. And I've been playing with mobiles as well myself, um, I love which it. I'll show you towards the end. So wonderful. <laughs> that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. So our next question comes from Lucy G. Um, these pieces are gorgeous. Have you ever used this art form as a tool to teach or increase interest in STEM subjects? Um, now you are one of our guest instructors at the San Francisco School of Needlework and Design. And while you um, have just recently taught a course with us, maybe you can talk a little bit about courses that are upcoming with the San Francisco School, uh, when our guests might expect to see those available for registration, or just in general, yes. some courses you're interested in developing over the long term. Yep. So um, yes, um, I had to have courses coming up, but they are, as you say, not specifically aimed at getting people engaged in STEM. But I can't help myself; everything I do will be <laughs> will be influenced by that. There's a course that I have. Um, with San Francisco SNAD that's coming up in March next year around um, making stitched birds. And these and are that not- will really, And that will be online. That will be online. And that um, these are not um, ornithologically accurate birds. These are um, inspired by birds. They're little creatures. Uh, like a lot of my stuff is fairly whimsical. Um, if you've seen my beetles, they're very whimsical. They're not. Um, they are inspired by but aren't super accurate they have six legs so the birds have two legs and they have a beak and they have eyes and they have little wings but they're, but they're not um, they're just birds from your imagination so that's a course that will be coming up in March I'm not sure when registrations open um, I'd have to check about that but that is um, we can up. certainly um, for everyone who's registered we certainly can send out a direct email to let them know about your future offerings so no worry about there and a lot of my work is um, and I'll show you a bit more of this in a moment, is tends towards being three-dimensional. So I tend to like my work to stand up by itself. Um, so a lot of my work that's come in, a lot of the coursework that we've been chatting about with the um, team at um, San Francisco SNAD is around exploring forms. So exploring how you can take needlework to a space that isn't just a flat space, but and not just raised needlework, but like something that stands by itself as a form. So um, there's possibilities for other uh, 3D embroidery style um, workshops coming up in the future as well, but we're still chatting about those. Wonderful, wonderful. So our next uh, comment and question comes again from Sari Blossom. 
as a girl raised by a dad who is a computer technician with an electronics component scattered all over the house. I love that glimpse of the resistors at the start. How were they made? He used um, to give me old hard drives to take apart because I enjoyed the components, textures, and patterns of the printed circuit boards. Not so organic, but lots of nice, inspiring stuff there. Have you ever even thought of incorporating um, items um, into your needlework from these technologies? Perhaps? Yes, I have. Yes. And I've got a, my own little connection, <laughs> collection of resistors and capacitors because I love them. And I love how um, circuit boards look like little cities. And um, so... First of all, to answer the first part of that question, they are Boolean knots in a fawn colour that I tried to get to match the resistor as much as I could that I then just couched down different coloured threads over to match the resistance code. So they, they are, um, you can probably look back at that slide and find out exactly what, how many ohms each of those, each of those um, resistors were because I made, I made them using the resistor code because I, I love, I love code. I love codes as well. So having messages coded into what you stitch um, is something that amuses, like excites me and amuses, makes it feels fun to me. So that um, is part of that as well. And yes, I agree. I do have my own little collection. And I've also briefly played with, but haven't gotten into, into e-textiles. So looking at having textiles that are actually wired up. And I have some of the components for that, little batteries and um, conductive thread and um, LEDs and so I have played a little bit in that space but um, it's not something I feel like I'm I've done enough work that I could really share it with people yet but yes I have it's very it's a fun place to play. So our next question comes from Caitlin can you recommend any resources for scientific illustrations or photos for reference maybe you could just offer something quite general yeah. as I know you are I'm going to send a little bit of some information yeah, yeah, yeah. to us to disseminate. Um, Personally, I love the fact that um, archive.org has a lot of free, old, free public domain, old scientific um, works available to trawl through. And um, certainly there are a lot, if, you look, if you're looking at scientific illustrators often on Wikipedia, there's often a link to any of their works that are on archive.org and then it'll be free to, to download and um, do with as you will. So that's, I guess, one thing that I would recommend if you're looking for free resources that a lot of these um, are either on archive.org or on Flickr and the licensing behind that's really clear that it's free to use and abuse and do what you like with so because it's um, old work and I find that super inspiring partly because it feels slightly nostalgic because often it's old lettering used for the labeling and it's got very much that etching style which has lots of texture to it and I immediately look at it and think oh, that could be that stitch and that could be that stitch so I highly recommend having a look at um, archive.org or Flickr's um, version of their content for um, free scientific illustration resources and I will send you the link to the Ernest Haeckel um, pieces there. Wonderful. So our next question comes from Sandra. Is needle lace the same as needle tatting? There are many, many different ways to talk, to make um, different types lace. of lace. Yeah. It's quite different. No, it's, it's, <laughs> it's not. Quite it's quite different. Yeah, it's just using a needle and thread. But it's kind of a it's weaving. Not using, kind of a weaving. Yeah, it's not using tatting techniques. Um, so, yeah. So, our no, next, it's quite different. Um, our next uh, technique, I'm sorry, question, excuse me, um, comes from Danielle Shelley. What kind of card do you use for your sequence? Ah, yes. Yeah, so I just use, for the ones that you're looking at now, um, this is just, I think it's, uh, I, the brands that we use will be different here, I suspect, but this is, a, I think it's Quill brand. And it's just, I got it from the wedding stationery section in our stationery shops. Um, it's supposed, I suspect it's supposed to be used for nice name backings for name tags or something. It's slightly shimmery and it's ivory, um, but I do recommend looking in places like that if you want a plain card that's got a bit of shimmer to it or has a bit of texture to it. Sometimes they've got textures to them. Um, and this one is acetry as well. So I was often looking when I'm looking at in the art supply section, it's usually a gimme, they're acid-free and oft, sometimes even lignin-free so they, they won't discolour or um, damage your work but um, in this case this one's an acid-free one but um, which is worth checking if you're adding it to your work and you want it to be to last for a long time. Absolutely and in the states very often they just refer to these as archival materials. Yes. 
So there is one question about uh, this event being recorded to be rewatched for anyone who has joined us late or has to uh, step out before our presentation is over. We will be making a recording of this presentation available. So you can go ahead and continue. Okay, fantastic. So um, this is um, again looking online at mic electron micrograph images of people may know these are butterfly wings close up. So these are the individual scales um, that butterfly wings have. And I wasn't the colors are beautiful, but I wasn't interested in the color so much as the shapes and the fact that they were overlapping each other and that this um, interested me because I'd recently been playing with this, which is again looking at paper. Um, this is watercolor paper this time and you can get watercolor paper that's quite strong, um, is often cotton or at least partly cotton. And I've painted these and, and doodled on them. and um, stitch them down. And I was originally thinking of this as being maybe a curved surface so that as it moved, the pieces would sit up slightly as they moved. And then I saw these butterfly images and I thought, wait a second, <laughs> this is a little bit like the stitching that I was playing with, just making my own sequence and stitching them down. What if I made something that was a little bit more like those scales in the butterfly wings? And so I started playing with that. So this, in this case, I just um, painted, got my watercolor paper out and painted um, them pale blue and then sort of tried to make a gradation to the dark section, except that didn't really work. So I ended up having to go with colored pencils and coloring the darks darker because it wasn't dark enough for me. But then I just got my scissors and cut them into little pieces and then just did a wiggly cut at the top of each um, little rectangle. Um, and the watercolour paper I was using kind of did strange, because it's slightly textured, kind of did strange things when I went over with the coloured pencil over the paper and made this speckly texture that I really enjoyed because it was a bit like the speckly textural um, nature of the surface of some of those um, butterfly wing scales. So I was thinking, okay, I'm going to make something out of this. This is, I'm, I'm happy. This is a happy place for me. And so... I then started playing with putting them on black fabric and you can see here um, that I've hole punched the top of them because I'm thinking about how I'm going to stitch them down and I gently went with through with my fingers and curved them slightly so that they would, as they sat on top of each other, wouldn't quite touch and so then you get this light across the surface so that they, um, that's part of what interested me in those, those electron micrograph images is that you could tell that they were sitting overlaying each other so I wanted that to be super super visible um, in the piece and then I started once I was happy with all of that I started stitching them down um, I originally was thinking maybe I'll do something that's a literal butterfly wing shape but again I really wanted it to be more of a nod to the butterfly than a literal butterfly and so what I ended up making was this so I made two triangular pieces, one of which has those butterfly scales that you can see um, stitched down. And the other one um, is kind of a nod to another piece that I've made a few years back that I haven't shown you today that has rows of bead and back stitch. And I really like, I really like that. that they sort of almost jump out of the, the darkness and like almost look like luminescent little um, phosphorescent things. And I like that idea of because butterflies are moths and perhaps nighttime. And so I just made these two wing ish shapes. Um, again, they're not huge. They're probably, oh, I've got them here. They're about, again, I think the largest one's about 10 inches at the longest dimension, and the other one's about half that. So they're only small and they're kind of just a nod to, to butterfly wings. So that's that little piece. This is my last biology piece. My next little section is going to be about my love for astronomy. Um, I grew up in Tasmania, which is lucky enough to have not much light pollution. So the night sky is amazing. And I was talking to you a bit about having a microscope for Christmas one year. For my 18th birthday, my parents bought me a telescope. And my brother is four years younger than me. So he was 14 at the time. And, you know, younger brother's 14. I'm not interested in any of this rubbish that you're doing. And but when I started standing on the driveway at night with the telescope, he started to become interested 
And he said he still remembers that night that I showed him Jupiter and he realised he was looking at a real planet for the first time. And so this has stuck with me um, a long time. So I not only do I sort of am inspired by scars, but Jupiter in particular holds a special place in my heart because of this. Um, this is part of a little, I went through a phase of making little textile books for my friends, for their kids. And this is one where I made one with the, where the main character is actually a finger puppet. So you can pull him out of his bed at the start and you put him on his finger and he can be the, or she, so it could be either, um, be the astronaut that's part of the space adventure as they go through. But I just made the little planets um, as little buttons that um, clip into the book. And this is me making Jupiter and a couple of the other planets and Jupiter's in chain stitch. And that little bottom, bottom piece is to show you again that this is secretly a family cloth as well, because although I've covered it up, this is one of my grandfather's handkerchiefs that I've stitched Jupiter on. I looked at his handkerchief. It reminded me of the stripes on Jupiter. I thought I have to use that in this piece. So that's the um, hidden, my grandfather's hidden inside Jupiter um, in this piece. So Jupiter, I've made a large piece, not a large, it's actually quite a small piece, but it took a long time. Um, focused around Jupiter and I just find looking at some of these photos that I see those swirls, the storms on Jupiter and it just screams texture to me and I just want to make something. So a few years ago I saw this image which is a series of images that NASA had published back in 2008 about they discovered that the great red spot which is a big storm was eating some of the smaller spot so this little red spot that appears next to it on the left marches into the great red spot and then doesn't come out the other side so it gets it gets taken into the big great red spot and I really loved this image and I stood, stared at it and I thought there's so many swirls and turbulence and things going on in this that I wanted to stitch it and so I did so this middle image is the one that I chose to stitch and so this is my stitching and um this is one of the very few pieces of embroidery I've ever done that I have framed and it sits over my bed. Um, so it's, there's that little red storm about to approach the big red spot and get completely engulfed. But I just I felt like chain, it is, it's apart from the two little storms, it's, which I sat stitch, everything else is chain stitch. And I've just varied the thickness of the thread and the direction of the stitch. And sometimes I've, to try and get that texture, I've used two or three different colored threads in the in my needle to try and get more texture in and I've just tried to get as much contrast and texture and um, try to really show that this is like violent turbulent storms happening so this is and there's a little bit it's hard to show in the photos but there's a little bit of metallic thread in there as well so that it really picks up and highlights some of those really turbulent areas and you can see that um, light play as you as the piece moves or as you move around the room that's my Jupiter piece. And then going back to my brother, my brother since that day has also been a little bit obsessed with the sky and um, he has bought himself a telescope as well. And my brother is not a STEM person um, in that he didn't go on to do STEM stuff at school. He's an art person. So he is a fantastic illustrator himself but he loves the sky and bought himself a telescope and a nice camera. And he took this photo of the moon. Um, so this is his photo. And I asked him if I could make him a stitched piece based on his photo. And this is the photo he sent me to do that. And I had no idea what I was going to do when I suggested this to him, um, this little family collab. But I have a little atlas of the solar system that's got some of these almost geological maps of the moon, like this top one here. And it's got a key and it's got all these different colours. And I looked at it and thought, that's what I want to do. Spoiler, this isn't what I ended up doing. <laughs> but I thought, that's what I want to do. So I went out. The first thing I did is I started map drawing out, oh, do I want it white on black? Do I want it black on white? How do I want to contrast this? How do I want to make this look um, real? Maybe I can do black work. I love black work. And so I started mapping out different stitches that I thought might work from a black work point of view and started playing with all of that. I thought, no, before I get into it, I need to do some samples. So, so um, sorry to interrupt you. Can yep. uh, some of our stitchers or guests may not be familiar with black work. So you can just yes. um, explain a little bit yep. about what you mean by that. Yeah, okay, I will. 
So black work is a technique that is a counted thread technique. So you're doing it on a gridded fabric, like maybe a, a linen where all the threads are easy to see and, and count, or um, sometimes on Aida, which is a, um, a fabric that has blocks of um, in its weaving, so you can easily see a grid. Um, so the bottom sample here is a black work sample. Um, it's a counted thread um, technique where you have a pattern that you use to create a texture. And sometimes quite often you can make variations of that pattern that are more dense or less, less dense to create shading or texture. So not surprisingly, seeing as I love pattern and I love grid and I love patterns that repeat but not quite, I am very drawn to black work. And traditionally it was done partly to mimic lace. So it was just done in black and white or sometimes just red and white, um, or just you know, you, white fabric black thread or uh, white fabric red thread. Uh, and it was used a lot in um, Elizabethan time as, times as edging on cuffs and collars because it, it gives you that lacy uh, um, look to it. So black work was one of the techniques I thought I might use on this piece. Again, spoiler, I didn't. Um, and the other technique I considered doing was applique, um, which is the top piece here. So just stitching down patches of fabric and my key could be those little patches of fabric as squares. Uh, and then maybe I'd go around it with a, with a, um, with a stem stitch outline or, or use stitches in different areas to, to emphasize different geological areas as I went. Um, I kind of did this one in the end, but um, you'll see what I mean in a moment. Was that an okay explanation of black work, Lauren? Absolutely. <laughs> okay, great. And the other thing I thought of was I've been playing a lot with layering, again, transparent or semi-transparent fabrics. And I thought maybe I could do the craters that way by putting one layer of fabric that was a circle and then stitching it down with another layer over the top. Um, and then remembering that floaty piece I did, um, that was the microorganisms, I started stitching down stem stitch circles and thought, wait a second, these are the perfect craters. I have to do this. So I threw away the black work idea altogether and I kind of used a hybrid of the top two of the, the layers of um, applique um, and um, semi-transparent semi fabrics. So having decided what I was going to do, I went away and traced out his photo just as dark areas and light areas and then cut out little templates and then use those template, um, templates to first of all cut out the big white section of the moon. Um, and I played with this a few times, so I don't think this outlines the eventual one I used, but I used one similar. And I got semi-transparent fabrics again, silks, organzas, tools, different sheer fabrics, and use my little templates to cut out those large patches of darkness that were craters or seas on the moon. And I gridded, I gridded up my fabric using a thread, and I'll show you there's a better photo of that in a moment, and just went around and used little stab stitches to applique all of these layers of fabric um, down. So that's what you can see here. This is a slightly better photo, but there's even a better photo in a second, but I just wanted to show you how that works. So there's the grid. You can see the semi-transparent layers of um, fabric. Again, I used some metallic ones. You can see the sheen of that there. And then although I've gently stab stitched around the edges of this, um, these pieces of um, fabric, I haven't turned them under, under or anything. There's no neat seams. It's just the raw edges. Again, it doesn't worry me too much if it frays. That kind of creates a soft edge and these are shadows anyway. Um, but I knew it would be held down once I'd done all of my stitching over the top. So um, I started to do some of the larger craters just to stem stitch circles. Here's a better photo. So you can see that grid that I've got laid out. I just drew a grid on a printout of my brother's photo and then started mapping out where the where all of the craters would go, the dark craters and the light craters. I did, because I had my little atlas and I knew where some of the larger craters were on the dark side of his photo, I stitched some of those down with black thread. And where I wanted to have a bit more of a gradation of color, I started throwing in 
French knots, either in grey or white or black, across some of those shadows to get more, a bit more of a gradation. Um, so that's this in progress. And this gives you a better feel for how the texture of the thing started to look as I move towards completion. Um, there are a lot, a lot of French knots in this piece and a lot of stem stitch circles. Um, so here's the finished piece. Um, just fresh out of the hoop and after a, a, a little bit of um, stretching out, out of the hoop. And there you can see it edge on um, finished. I ended up, um, just to emphasize those edges, I ended up stem stitching a black around the dark side and around the light side in white. Um, and there's his photo. So you can kind of see how it came out at the end. And it's not, I look at it and say, it's not perfect, but it's pretty close. Like, I feel like you can look at my piece and know that it's the moon. And if you saw his photo, you'd know that was the photo I'd used. And then I shipped that off to, um, to my brother and he framed that up. And so he has that. So I can't show you any of the detail, um, details. I'll talk about the details of that. But um, that's my moon, my moon piece. So we have a few more questions yep. um, if you'd like to pause. Okay. Yes, no worries. Absolutely, absolutely. So our next question, and this is about the butterfly wings and it comes from Andrea Feynman. I love the depth on the butterfly wing triangle. Are those blue butterfly wing scales made of paper? And did you dye the paper yourself? I know you talked about painting a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So they were, they were watercolor paper. And yes, I painted them myself. Um, I started off by painting strips of watercolor paper in those gradations and then cutting them into those little rectangles. Um, but as I said, I wasn't super happy with my painting. So I ended up going back over with colored pencil and darkening some of the dark, like the bases of each one to try and create more depth. So yes, so it's a combination of watercolor and, pen and colored pencil, but it's on watercolor paper. And I think it was on about 300 GSM, so about 140 pound, I think it is, um, watercolor paper. Wonderful. So our next question comes from Valerie Silver. For the Jupiter piece you framed, did you improve, improvise the storm or draw it first on paper um, when you did your inspiration? Uh, yeah, no, I, what I did was I stitched, what I often do is I, um, I got the photo and sort of measured out the, the how big each of the sections of storms were. And then I translated that into my, um, like did a scale, like you know, I can't remember what it was, like one to 1 1.7 or whatever it was down to my piece. My piece is quite small. It's only like 13 centimetres. I don't know, is that four and a half-ish inches? It's quite a small piece, but it's very detailed. And so then I stitched, I just did running stitch, um, basting stitch outlines for where the spot would be and where the major storm um, divisions were. So I did that first and then I just changed stitched over the top of all of that. So you can't even see those um, marking stitches um, once I finished. Wonderful. Okay. So this is um, one more astronomy based piece before I move on to my math stuff. Have I got enough time to keep going? I don't want to. Yes. Yes, okay, cool. So this is, um, I have the next like, major piece I had is based on two things. It's based on astronomy, but it's also based on this little obsession I have about blue yellow, um, that it doesn't always make green. And that when I look up at the sky at night, if it's a clear sunset or a sunrise, I can see that the sky grades from blue to, through to yellow. And so somewhere in there, there's this colour called blue yellow in my, in my head that is, isn't green. And so a lot of my work secretly, although not overtly, is actually partly exploring the interactions between blue and yellow. And um, that's not something that I usually um, mention in the work itself. It's just if I'm going to choose colours and there's a space there where I can play with the interaction between colours. I often choose blue and yellow. Um, so that's the first thing to keep in mind when we look at this piece. And the second thing to keep in mind is that it's about the solar system. Um, it's only about the inner solar system. So it's only about Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, um, because I didn't want it to be too crazy huge. But what I did do when I started this piece is I went to this place um, 
the planets today and found out exactly where the planets were on the day that I started. So when I made this piece, I got the angles out and marked in exactly where the sun was and the planets were before I started then marking out on the fabric again using running stitch where I wanted my stitching to be. So two things behind that, the blue yellow exploration and the solar system. So this is the piece. Again, it's black work looking at these different and black work has a lot of traditional patterns that exist. Um, and so part of this was exploring again, this blue yellow um, interaction. But I also was thinking about how space is not empty, it's complex. It's the solar system is a system, the planets and the sun are interacting and they, their movements affect one another. And so part of doing the black work is that I wanted to get the idea that as um, we move away from the sun and its gravitational influence, there's less and less particles, there's less and less um, radiate, like radiation, less and less particles in the, in the um, in space. And so as I moved away from the sun, I wanted those black work textures to become less and less dense as well. So the central sections use a combination of darker threads and more dense stitching. And then as I move out from that, I um, both tone down the colors and tone down the density of stitching. You can see here what I was talking about is some patterns lend themselves well to becoming less and less dense by dropping out elements of the pattern as you, as you stitch. Um, so all this is is blocks of different patterns, counted patterns, and I've just separated them with couch down white thread. And then around each um, area, I've um, just stem stitched in um, a little border that's the same color as the main color in the stitching. And then the planets themselves are these little circles that are sitting in those white boundaries um, that are kind of representing orbits for the planets. And it's not the scale because the piece isn't quite big enough for that but the angular place of the planets represents where they were on the day I started stitching so that's that and this piece is one of my larger pieces and I do have that here I can show you when we get to that bit so that's all of my um sciencey things and I have I think two or three maths um influenced pieces to talk to people about if we still have time we have about 15 minutes or so left okay. of our presentation, but we okay. do have a couple more questions. Um, so our next there? question comes from Nicola Tyler at or Tillyard, excuse me. And um, Nicola's question is, hi, Michelle, interested to know what kind of time frame went into the moon piece, such a beautiful labor of love. Hi, Nicola. <laughs> Thank you for coming, Nicola. <laughs> You're amazing. Um, I went to school with Nicola. So um, my um, moon piece, um, I'd have to have a look. It did take time. Um, I'd have to look how many days worth of stitching, but it was during a time when I was working, doing freelance work rather than working full-time or part-time. And so I had a big block of time where I could just sit and stitch all day. So yes, um, I I don't know how many hours people often ask with textile art, how, how long did it take you? I don't know exactly how long um, it took. Uh, so I, I can look it up. I'll let you know. I'll get back to you. <laughs> um, and I'll our next you. question comes from Kristen. How much of stitching do you sketch out and how much is done as you go more improv like? Yeah, um, it varies. So with a piece like the solar system piece, that was, um, although I didn't, draw out on that fabric the outline I what I tend to do is stitch out an outline I tend to use running stitch and stitch out um, outlines for my work in a way that either it will be covered so I use something that's a similar color to either my work or the fabric or I um, do it in a way that I can easily pull it out um, and I'll show you a really good actually I have the second maths piece I have to show you has a really good example of how I mark out my work with um, running stitch so I'll be able to show you that in a moment but I often draw it out on at least roughly on a piece of paper first, especially mm -hmm. for, for larger pieces. Wonderful. So um, our next question comes from Robin Roderick um, and they're just asking about fuller pictures of your solar system piece. Um, again, we're going to share um, information with regards to seeing more of Michelle's work. 
because this is just a, a snapshot of her many yeah. pieces um, and you'll be able to uh, contact me um, for those. I have um, an album for that on Flickr. So that I've got a whole album with just photos of that piece if um, you're interested on Flickr. So that's an easy way to have a look at more details. Um, and I actually have, I feel like I'm selling out here, but I actually have that piece available as a pattern on my, on my shop to purchase. It's $12 Australian. Um, so if you want to stitch it, it's a monster, but I have gridded all of those black work patterns up into um, a 13 page black work pattern if you like a challenge. <laughs> so um, if you, if that piece strikes you, whoops, go back. Okay, maths. So um, this is a small, a small piece. It's a large piece, but it doesn't have a lot of um, background to it. But this is about Voronoi diagrams. Um, and there's lots of certain bits of maths that fascinate me. Um, number theory, patterns, combinatorics, um, I love fractals and graph theory and geometry and folding and structures. And um, so for this piece, the Voronoi piece, it's about a diagram that if you put some points on a plane, little, there's like, I don't know, 20 little dots on that, on that square, that you can create little regions around each point so that, that all of the um, points in that region are closer than any other region. So if you look at the pink area, the, the large pink area in the top there, there's a red area above it that um, there's no points in the um, red area that are close to the dot than all of the points in the pink area. Anyway, so that's Voronoi diagrams. And there's multiple ways of constructing a Voronoi diagram for any given set of points. And this fascinated me. So I found, and they exist in nature in a lot of ways. So there's lots of places in nature where the shapes that are formed are formed because they start at a point, like a tree, you use a tree trunk comes up and then it branches out. And then a tree shape um, in a canopy um, so if you're looking top down and looking at the canopy of all of the trees, often forms a Voronoi diagram because they all come from this one point. And so here are some examples of Voronoi diagrams in nature. But that fascinated me. So this, I went online and found a Voronoi diagram generator and um, printed out a Voronoi diagram. And then this is one of those examples where I marked this out by uh, actually literally stitching through pa the, the paper. And um, so I stitched my diagrams onto this piece, um, stitch all the edges on um, just with running stitch through paper. And then I tore the paper off at the end um, and it was just printer paper. And yes, it was painful. <laughs> but once I did that, then I just went around and chain stitched the, all of the lines from the Voronoi diagram. And then I wanted the feeling of there being shapes behind that. It felt like a net to me. So I wanted the feeling of there being shapes behind there. And so I, just went through and just chain stitched some of those areas in um, red and purple and orange just to to make some of those so it felt a bit more like a net over something rather than just a so that's kind of one mathematical thing that intrigued me I love combinatorics this is about um, a little tiny piece I did a whole series of index card pieces where I just did a stitching that would fit on an index card and this is one of those and it was about um, different combinations of how you can join up one dot, how you can join up two dots, how you can join up three dots, how you can join up four dots, how you can join up five dots, and all the different combinations. And this interested me because I'd been recently thinking about black work again and making my own black work patterns. And I was doing this in a very systematic way where I was thinking about uh, they were all based in this little octagonal style shape. And I was thinking about, okay, if I draw this like little cross, how many different ways are there then to build on that little cross and make other black work patterns. And so this is like an exercise in looking at combinations and permutations. And um, so this is more a process thing than a piece of work. But um, again, drawing on that, that combinatorics and doing things in a methodical way and looking at which patterns are actually the same pattern, but just rotated and, and things like that. And this is the last piece I have to share with you today. Um, and it's a large-ish piece. It's a commission. The, um, I won't talk about the personal aspects of this because it's a piece of client work, but um, we were looking at, she wanted something fairly mathematical. So we were looking at different shapes and we set it on a parabola. Uh, it, 
it's in nature, it represents growth and trajectories and the space above the parabola is infinite, the parabola grows infinitely and these are all things that appeal to her. And this, so first thing I did is I went away and I did some samples. So here are some sample pieces looking at different stitches and different colours. She showed me some of the colours that she liked. Um, ult spoiler, ultimately this failed. So this piece has never been finished. So just as an aside, so um, we don't get too invested in this. Um, so this is just me playing with some stitches. And then this is what I was talking about with marking it out. So once I had that we was what we wanted to do and how big it was, I went in and I marked the axis out and the parabola shape itself out with um, running stitch. You can see that more clearly here. They're just big running stitches. So um, they're fairly neat and they follow up. I follow the grain of the, of the, the fabric. So they're very um, precise, but they're just running stitches. And then I stem stitch, um, couch down an outline and start stitching. And again, you can see this repeated pattern thing. It's slightly black wacky leaning and um, it doesn't use changing the stitch to generate different um, textures. It looks more at changing the color of the thread. But you can see as I go, I map out regions with thread as I go. Um, and some of this just gets taken. So these couch down white outlines just get taken out. Um, and so this is it partly done. And I sat and stitched some of those um, radiating shapes because we we're after something that looked like it was radiating. And this is the piece in its current state. So it's, I, I have taken it out of the frame. <laughs> I have taken it out of the frame and it's hanging. But um, for, for multiple reasons, my communication with the client wasn't the best. And the, the piece didn't, met, at some point, her vision of what the piece would be and my vision of what the piece would be went two different ways. And so, um, at the moment, it's kind of in limbo, um, but I did take the samples and made little buttons out of them, and I'm really happy with the little buttons, but I'm not really happy with the large piece. But um, again, it was, it was, I'm just like, sharing with you because it was mathematic inspired. It, it had that, um, that, that background. And part of the maths science aspect to it was why she approached me to do the work in the first place, because she liked, she could see that in my work. So. Um, that was that. So that piece is still in, in still in limbo. I, I call it a failure. And I, it's uncomfortable talking about it, but I wanted to show you because it has that mathematical background. So um, that's some of my science and maths work. I'm currently looking at, as we mentioned, mobiles and stability. So I've been playing with making little colder esque um, mobiles, and. Um, been looking at um, Turing patterns, which I found out about, which are, I do have a little photo here, here, um, which are um, patterns that exhibit in nature that are due to two different substances interacting with different properties. Um, and it, it actually occurs in nature in all sorts of different places, but I love the pattern and it just screams needlework to me. I want to do something with it. Um, and I'm always still playing with blue yellow. So my first Turing piece will probably be a blue yellow like those two networks will probably one will probably be blue and one will probably be yellow um, but I guess the last thing I wanted to say was about following your own path um, and that I don't have a trained art background I don't have a trained stitching background I just do a lot of stitching um, but I feel like if you make what you love um, and don't listen to the police out there that tell you that you have to do it this way or that way and your approach has to be this or that you know maths is boring and science is boring and there's no beauty in these things because because there are um, and that you can show that you love these things through your stitching um, that I hope that this has inspired you in some way to follow some of your own passions and stitch what stitch what you love wonderful um, I think it's really lovely and um, again you keep, keep saying that you don't have artistry or what have you or that background but it, you have it very intuitively because you know you're developing with a high level sophistication different methodologies to create different types of objects and you're bringing a really um, brilliant 
experimental approach. Again, a lot of more traditionally trained stitchers uh, often approach things with a doctrinal attitude about, um, as you said, uh, doing things in a very particular way, but um, you're very artfully experimenting, being very thoughtful and meticulous about discovering both the capabilities and different uses and different interpretations of some very historical stitches. Um, so I think that's really, really lovely. Um, and I'd like to thank you so much today for joining us in. Unfortunately, we will not be able to get to all of our questions. Um, there were, again, uh, several comments about recordings. If you email me, and I'll include this in the chat, um, l-a-u-r-e-n at sfsnad.org, um, you can request a recording um, when it's available, and uh, Michelle is going to send me her materials um, that we can then share with you. Yep, and um, that will have my contact details on it. So if you do have questions from the session that you want to shoot through to me, please, you can message me on Instagram or you can send me an email. There's my email address there if you want to email me. But that will also be on the PDF if you, if you want to get the PDF from Lauren with the resources that we use today. We'll have um, my contact details on it. Wonderful, wonderful. So I'm going to go ahead and stop.